The original version of Luke probably started with what is now chapter three, verse one, and the original version of Luke did not have the birth narrative. The story of Jesus being born in Bethlehem to a virgin in Luke chapters one and two. And some scholars have also thought that the book of Acts uh, went through a couple of different versions. You get different kinds of Christianity in different parts of the uh, of the growing Christian community throughout the world. Kind of like today, you know, if you take um, if, you, if you go to Moscow and look what Christianity is like there, it's very different from uh, what you're going to find uh, in, in uh, someplace in uh, Georgia. <laughs> You know, what I mean? like, like it's very, it's very different. And what you find in the deep south is very different from what you find in the north, uh, in the northeast, in, in America. And so, different places have different forms of Christianity. And in the early church, that's how it happened. But then they didn't have mass communication, and so these individual communities would start out and they would develop their own views and their own ideas and things without having a lot of contact with everybody else. They can't just send emails back and forth to figure out who do you think Jesus was. You know, the Unknown Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Our airman is doing a brand new course on these, separating the four and telling you what each of them designed to tell you about who Jesus is. By the way, spoiler alert, they're not all the same. They don't all have the same message. Dr. Bart Airman is going to demonstrate this in his course. And if you click on the link below, you will have the true gnosis of these Gospels. You also will be helping me out a lot too. I get a commission on these, and if you'd like to support my channel, this would be a great way to help support. Also, you'll be learning a lot of this information that is really, really deeply rooted in scholarship. Bart's one of the greatest of our time, and he's really passing down a lot of knowledge that he has worked on in his scholarship at being a professor for all these years in the study of the New Testament Christian origins. This is one of the one of the courses that I recommend more than any other. And I'll see you over there. All right. So Dr. Bart Ehrman, good to see you again, as always. And uh, of course, I just mentioned in that um, segment before this about this, the class coming up, the course. And I, I want to get right into it. So my, my question is, the, we got these four main gospels. I know there's also extra biblical sources, but these four main gospels, when were they, what, what, what are the dates that you think, not like the, what is your opinion on the dating of these four? And then um, how do they get named what they're named? Okay, yeah, big questions. And so the, um, you know, my, my opinion on the gospel dates is basically the common view. It's not something I came up with. It's just, like, it's what, what just about all historical scholars, not all, but I mean, most historical scholars think, which is that Mark was probably our first gospel written around the year 70 of the common era. So if Jesus died around the year 30, about 40 years after Jesus' death. Uh, Matthew and Luke were almost certainly later than Mark, and they're usually dated to the mid-80s or so, 80, 85, something like that of the common era. John is usually thought to be the last gospel written around 90 to 95 uh, of the common era. And so these are books written about 40 to 65 years after, after Jesus' death. They're named uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We don't know who the actual authors were. The authors are uh, don't tell us their names. They're written anonymously. They're written in uh, Greek, in a high level Greek, for uh, which means that the authors were Greek speaking Christians of a later generation who were well educated, which suggests that they uh, were not written by Jesus' own followers, who were lower class, uneducated uh, peasants who spoke Aramaic. Interesting. And when does the first, when's the first reference of them being named, for example, when's the first time someone called Mark, Mark? Do we know? Yeah, yeah we do know. Yeah. Well, we know what the first on record, um, and, but it's complicated. This is a complicated question. I just did another course, by the way, that, that was called, um, uh, were Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? <laughs> And people can see that on my on my website because I've got I've got this course. It's in right. and it's a very interesting very interesting issue. The first time somebody mentions uh, a Mark is uh, a church father named Papius, who was writing in maybe around the year one thirty or so. We're not quite sure one twenty one forty somewhere in there. Um, who says that Mark was the secretary of Peter and he wrote down everything that he heard Peter say about Jesus, uh, and he says that Matthew wrote down an account of Jesus sayings. In, in Hebrew. Uh, and so he mentions Matthew and Mark. 
doesn't mention Luke or John in our surviving accounts. And it's not clear. In fact, I, I rather doubt when he mentions Matthew, he doesn't seem to be talking about our Matthew because our Matthew isn't a, isn't a list of Jesus sayings and it wasn't written in Hebrew. <laughs> so uh, and I don't know if he's talking about our Mark or not. The first time we actually have anybody name these books, you know, call them Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and quote them. So we know they're talking about our books is uh, in the writings of Irenaeus who was a church father writing around the year 180 or so, 180, 185. And so that's about 100 years after these books were in circulation that we first have somebody who not, to, not only quotes the books, but actually tells you who they thought wrote them. Interesting. Um, is there any any chance that some of these, like maybe Luke X, for example, which is pretty long and tradition says that he wrote both of these books. Is it possible this is a rolling text that it could have been, there could have been a like a original version and then, someone added something to it later on and then over the course of like a century is finally luke x is that possibility or no yeah uh, several things to say about that it's, it's a possibility scholars have certainly considered um luke and acts is usually understood itself as being a two-volume work um that they almost almost certainly with the same author if you read the first few verses of Luke and then the first few verses of Acts, it's pretty clear it's the same guy and the 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 literary style the the hand the writing style the the themes the theology the beliefs like it's very consistent throughout Luke and Acts and so that's clear some people some scholars have thought that Luke went through a couple of different versions that there was an original version that was put in circulation and uh, that we later had some additions put onto it I personally think that that's right I, I'm not completely convinced of it but I think it's probably right that ori the original version of Luke probably started with what is now chapter three verse one and the original version of Luke did not have the birth narrative wow. the story of Jesus being born in Bethlehem to a virgin in Luke chapters one and two and some scholars have also thought that the book of Acts uh, went through a couple of different versions well, the reason for, th for thinking that's a little bit different we actually have different manuscripts of Acts that are significantly different from each other about seven and a half one one kind of it version is about seven and a half percent longer than the other one. And some people thought that Luke did two versions that got put in circulation. And so that's all possible. But it would not have taken a century. Uh, and it, it would not have been the kind of thing where what we have is a book by committee. Uh, it's really, it is almost entirely, both books are almost entirely by the same person. Uh, and whether uh, parts were added. It's possible he added them. Probable that he added, or maybe somebody else did. So I don't. I don't think we should think of these two books as books by committee, though. And for for people who doubt that, what would you say? Is it textual criticism that proves this? Well, we don't have any manuscripts that support the idea that it's, it's a book by committee, uh, and we and the main reason for thinking that it's not a book by committee is the internal consistency. And so, for example, if if uh, if you if you write a suppose you write an essay, and I come in and start a, and I add a page here and there, you're going to tell the difference just by the way I write. I mean, right. I write differently from the way you write. And so, um, so so what scholars have done is they've analyzed the text very carefully in the Greek, and they've looked for writing style. Uh, and on a very, very complicated level, including things, what kind of conjunctions does this person use? How does this person use subordinate clauses? How do, how do they use participle? Different people use these things differently without even thinking about it. And, but if you, so if you analyze a writing that way, well, you can see pretty well if it's, it's almost certainly the same author or possibly not. Now, I'm not an expert in Greek. I'm actually just starting to learn a little bit of it, but it seems like the narrative in Acts for after chapter eight, I think it is, just goes from, you know, talking about how great Peter is, all of a sudden Paul is the main character. Do you think that might be some someone somewhat of a change in the style, or is this com completely yeah. consistent in your opinion? Well, you do not see a difference in the Greek after that. Uh, you see a difference in the subject. And if you carefully read Luke and Acts and, and try to understand it as a, as a gestalt, as a, like a whole thing, a two-volume work, it makes perfect sense what happens. Paul converts in chapter 9. Um, so the first eight chapters are about the church in Jerusalem and what's going on there. But the point of Acts that's announced already in verse 8 of chapter 1 is that it's going to be about how the gospel goes from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. Sure. And Paul is the one who makes that happen. So he converts in chapter 9. And in chapters 10 and 11, Peter ends up 
having this supernatural vision that informs him that Paul's view is going to be right. <laughs> and then Paul starts on his missionary journeys and Paul carries out his missionary journey. And so there's, there's complete continuity. It, it's true that the subject changes, but it changes in part because Acts, it's different from the book of Luke. I mean, Luke is the life of the ministry of Jesus. That's it, right. just a year or two. Acts covers 30 years. Right. And so, uh, so it, it's necessarily going to have a change of topic. <clears throat> That's very interesting. The disconnect between what Paul is saying sometimes in these epistles and what's written in the Gospels, what do you think happened there? Do you think there's a, do you think there's just a different approach? Are they different in a different location? Are they disagreeing about certain yeah. things? Yeah, no, it's a good point. It's not just Paul between the Gospels; it's the Gospels among themselves. They they have different perspectives and and yes. different ideas about who Jesus is and what he said. And 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 Paul is a different thing. And I think what's going on is that um, you get different kinds of Christianity in different parts of the uh, of the growing Christian community throughout the world. Kind of like today, you know, if you take um, if you if you go to Moscow and look what Christianity is like there, it's very different. From uh, what you're going to find uh, in in uh, someplace in uh, Georgia, <laughs> you know, what I mean? like, like it's very it's very different. And what you find in the Deep South is very different from what you find in the North uh, in the Northeast in, in right. America. And so different places have different forms of Christianity. And in the early church, that's how it happened. But then they didn't have mass communication, and so these individual communities would start out and they would develop their own views, and their own ideas, and things without having a lot of contact with everybody else. They can't just send emails back and forth to figure out who do you think Jesus was? You know, they, they so so their, their views develop in different ways. And so within the New Testament, you definitely have different authors with different points of view. And that's one of that's one of the things I'm going to be emphasizing in this course is that the four the, the, what scholars know about these four gospels now is they have to be taken individually. You can't pretend they're all saying the same thing, because if you do, you misunderstand what they're all saying. Yeah, that's a really good point. Now, I want to. Now, Mar since Mark is the first one and John's the last one, I just want to compare these two. But just, just, I'm just picking two out of out of the box, not not for any reason in particular. What what would you say the difference is in the way they portray Jesus between Mark and John? Well, I would say there, I would, I, you know, there are lots and lots of differences. I would say that two of the really big ones are, um, what did Jesus teach? Um, in, in Mark's gospel, Jesus' entire message is that there's a kingdom of God that is coming, it's coming soon, and you need to prepare for it by repenting of your sins, uh, otherwise you're going to be destroyed. <laughs> and so you need to get ready for this coming kingdom. Jesus doesn't teach about who he is in Mark. Just says very, very little about who he is. And when he talks about himself, it's just that he's going to go to Jerusalem to die. That you know, he doesn't say anything about it, who he is personally. In the Gospel of John, all he talks about is who he is. He never talks about the kingdom of God coming and needing to repent in preparation for this coming kingdom. It's all about who his identity as one who's come from heaven to earth to reveal the truth of God so that people can have a heavenly birth. And, and it's all about Jesus' identity. So, well, that's rather big. Did Jesus call himself God? Well, in John, he's constantly talking about his divine identity. Right. In Mark, he never does. So that's that's big. The other, second thing is, why does he do miracles? In, in Mark, he never does miracles to prove who he is. When they want him to do a miracle to prove who he is, he refuses. He won't do it. He does miracles to help people. In the Gospel of John, he does miracles to prove who he is. And John actually tells us that's why the miracles are done. He called, Mark, John calls them signs. They're to signify. They're signs of who Jesus actually is. Pretty big differences. And, you know, those aren't the only ones, obviously. Do you think that these gospels are reflecting a different type of christianity like a, a variety of christianity in early on yes i think that they are different varieties of christianity but i would say that because these four were chosen by church fathers to be the new testament that there are basic continuities among these four if any of them was radically different uh you know they wouldn't have included it and so these do represent the four views that 
church leaders in the third, fourth, fifth centuries said, look, these are these are the definitive ones. And once they're put into a Bible, of course, they're all read as if they're saying the same thing. <laughs> That's a mistake. Uh, but it's also a mistake to say that, you know, they that they are crazily different. You know, it's not like in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, well, there are 360 gods. And uh, actually, I'm from Mars. <laughs> you, know, I mean, like, you know, they are crazily different. Yeah. And the reason why I bring that up, I was talking to Dr. Mark Andrew about this. And um, and we're, if you go to like the Wikipedia page for Christianity, it's it's and this is a really common misconception about Christianity. It starts off the great church and then all of a sudden it branches off into heresies and different types yeah. of Christianity. But really, it's kind of the opposite, especially when you look at how these gospels are portraying Jesus. It seems like there's a big variety in the beginning and then yeah. it sort of swells, goes down into a church. Yeah, I, I agree with that. That was a breakthrough that happened in scholarship in the 1930s. Uh, a, a scholar named Walter Bauer in Germany came to realize that it's not like Christianity was one thing. You know, it started out as like the Council of Nicaea going back to the days of Jesus. And then you have these little offshoot heresies. It's that what you have is a wide variety to begin with that are fighting over which view is right. And they hammer out this kind of consensus view and get rid of a bunch of views. And that ends up being the Catholic Church. Wow, excellent. Well, just so you guys know, the link's in the description for the course. And I'm telling you, I'll be there. You don't want to miss this. This is going to be one of the best courses ever. And you have just attained true gnosis. The Unknown Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Our airman is doing a brand new course on these, separating the four and telling you what each of them designed to tell you about who Jesus is. By the way, spoiler alert, they're not all the same. They don't all have the same message. Dr. Bart Airman is going to demonstrate this in his course. And if you click on the link below, you will have the true gnosis of these Gospels. You also will be helping me out a lot too. I get a commission on these and if you'd like to support my channel, this would be a great way to help support. Also, you'll be learning a lot of this information that is really, really deeply rooted in scholarship. Bart's one of the greatest of our time and he's really passing down a lot of knowledge that he has worked on in his scholarship and being a professor for all these years in the study of the New Testament Christian origins. This is one of the one of the courses that I recommend more than any other. And I'll see you over there.